I guess we might as well get started and let him do it. So uh, first off is uh, Joe talking about securing Postgres. Joe? Yeah, actually, this this uh, is just an idea that came out of the talk that I'm going to do tomorrow, which is much longer on securing Postgres. It was just too detailed to do in that talk. So uh, it's basically just a, what it's something I thought was a neat idea. It was actually inspired by Magnus. He did a talk at one point on um, TARDIS for Postgres. So this is the idea of doing kind of a history table using RLS, range types, and partitioning. So basically, you start out, you create the base table called time travel. It's got two regular fields, and then this TR field is basically a time range, TSTZ range. And the idea is basically that the upper part of the range is going to be set to infinity for current rows, and it's going to be set to some value for rows that are expired, or in other words, rows that are either have been deleted or updated. So in one partition, the first partition, I set the constraints so that basically the upper range being infinity goes into that partition. The other one is called history, and so if the upper range of the of the TR range column is not infinity, it'll end up in that partition. This uh, get pit function is just kind of a utility function. I did this with kind of a custom uh, configuration variable. I know Tom hates when I do that, but it does work pretty well for kind of session variables. And I'm just going to set that thing to a value. If, if it is a value, then I'll use it. If it's not a value, I'll just use the current clock timestamp. Uh, and then I set alter table and I enable row level security and create a policy that basically says, um, is my TR field, uh, does it contain this, this timestamp that I'm using? And then finally, there's a trigger that will maintain this for me. So if anytime I update a row, I'll make sure that I create the old row with the upper range of the, of the TR field set to the current clock timestamp. And a, any new row, the lower range has the current timestamp. So that's the function and the trigger down there. So now just you know generate some data so that we can see how it works. And then in this first update statement, I'm changing one of the values uh, where ID equals 42. And I'm going to return the, uh, the timestamp basically and, and set a uh, psql variable point in time that I can refer back to later. I then delete another row, and you can see when I do my query, I only see the row that I expect to see based on the current time. And I'm going to do a couple more updates, and I see exactly what I would expect to see. But then when I set this config variable, based on that point in time I captured earlier, which was before I deleted that row 4242, now you can see I'm seeing the original update number one instead of update number three, and I'm seeing row 4242, just as if I had gone back in time. But if I reset myself to the super user, super user does not get affected by RLS, and now I can see all the rows. And that's all I have. Well, thank you, Joe, for taking my idea and making it more awesome with partitioning and RLS. Uh, next up is Thomas. And yeah. I don't know okay. what this is. <laughs> we'll see about that. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to be speaking about Scheme and Postgres. Um, <clears throat> so about a year ago, I saw this email. I was eating my cornflakes in the morning and reading the commit log. And um, I saw that, does this work? Yeah, PL Scheme had been removed from the, the manual as something that was supported. And I, I, I had a lot of, a lot of <laughs> I had a lot of thoughts that came to me at once, like, well, we actually have PL Scheme, and, and you know, and now we don't have it. And um, but then I started wondering, what could you actually do with Scheme inside a database? Why would you want to use Scheme inside Postgres? And there's an idea that I had sort of been wondering about in the past, in, in another context altogether. If you want to move code closer to data, like typically if you've got some kind of, like say, a web server taking requests and then making a bunch of requests against the database to build the response, um, you know, you, you might make multiple requests to the database, and you might not want to do that, so you might come up with ideas about using stored procedures or something to, to, to reduce the, the number of round trips that you make. <coughs> stored procedures, or I should say F manager functions or extensions, are fun, but they're kind of also not always fun. And I thought, well, what if we could just use alien technology to just like 
make the code move into the database without having to do all that stuff, just using magic. Um, and I thought, well, this would be a nice experiment to see if I could do this. So I, I tried to do this on my flight to Canada, which was quite long, so I managed to get it kind of working, and I wanted to talk about it. <laughs> really what I'm doing here is just showing a, a like a, <laughs> really I'm just trying to raise interest in PL scheme, but this is like a, a, a use for it. Um, so, yeah. Here's some code doing a bunch of stuff, running a bunch of queries, and if you wrap it in this, um, this remote form which I cooked up, then it'll just magically move this code into the database and run it there. So without the pink remote XY thing, and you can see that it's actually, that block of code is doing three updates, and it's using variables that are in the local scope. If you wrap it in this remote thing and tell it which variables need to be kind of transferred when it does this, um, you could come up with something cleverer that could analyze that automatically, but I just did it explicitly. Um, and in this case down here, this is a, um, an expression which runs a couple of database queries and then builds a string containing bits of both of them. And the, 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 you know, the whole thing gets pushed down to the database if you wrap it in that remote thing. So basically, this is compiling code and like caching it inside the database and um, reusing it so that it's relatively efficient um, and getting the result back to you. So you could just put, put that around it or not. It'll still work um, both ways, either locally or remotely. Uh, another thing which I'm interested in doing with Scheme um, in Postgres is automatic transaction management. So, for example, if you're using serializable and you want to deal with retries, uh, if you explicitly or declaratively mark the chunk of your code that is um, a transaction, then it can help you retry, and, and uh, that's quite useful. Um, if you combine those two things, then you get, finally, a system which can automatically retry transactions when it needs to and also um, do a single round trip to the database. Uh, and that's what that's showing there. Um, now, if you <laughs> if you um, <laughs> if you push random code into a database and execute it, then I don't know. I mean, presumably this user already had some. It's the same with running stored procedures. If, if you grant someone the ability to, to, to define stored procedures and let them run them, then you know, then they can do anything that that stored procedure could do. Whether this is worse than that, I don't know. I mean, you could. <laughs> Probably the solution to, you know, the way to manage that is probably based on modules. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's probably some module-based solution you could do. My main point here isn't really to say that you should do this. <laughs> it's really just to show PL Schema's back um, and to raise interest in, in, and see if anyone's interested in, in, in um, uh, develop, uh, helping get that back into a uh, usable form. Um, that's, that's all I got. Cool. Yeah, that was not entirely what I expected when I saw the title. <laughs> that's interesting. So, uh, next up, we have a new extension, PGPG. Uh, and with Jules, who is going to teach us all about it. Do you want the clicker? Yeah, thank you. There we go. Go ahead. Thanks. I'm uh, currently working in a new extension to uh, emulate uh, a global uh, temporary table in PostgreSQL. Uh, this is uh, the ORAC still uh, temporary, uh, global temporary table, which means that this is also uh, what is defined in the standard SQL. So you have a permanent tables created by the DBA. Uh, Everyone, every, every user can insert uh, data in, in this table, but it only sees its own row. Uh, row are persistent on transaction or in per session, and we can create uh, the, the temporary table in any schema. This is not the case with the uh, usual uh, PostgreSQL uh, temporary table. It works uh, with uh, an analog tables for performance, and uh, an item column who stores uh, the session ID, the PA, the backend PID, with uh, the backend start time. Uh, there is also a role level security to uh, hide, uh, to uh, make uh, user only see his rows, and there is a view to hide the, the PG. Uh, the hidden column.
the, rule, the rows can, cannot be removed by the backend. Uh, it will be too, too slow, so uh, there is a background worker who uh, connect to each database and remove uh, obsolete rows uh, per session or per uh, transaction. Uh, it's, five, it's a five second uh, uh, nap time for uh, the background work uh, by default, but you can tune this. Uh, what next? Uh, this is an extension that could be very helpful for uh, ORAC to PostgreSQL migration because uh, glo global temporary tables are uh, often uh, found in uh, ORAC database. And uh, if you have uh, an application who is uh, creating too much uh, and deleting too much tablets, you have bloat in your catalog, so this can help you. Uh, this is a fresh extension, so it's uh, a bit slow now. Uh, I have to work more on this extension, but the, the goal is it's to make a POC, a proof of concepts to have a, a patch uh, for in PostgreSQL core. Uh, once I have something uh, performant, I will uh, submit uh, um, a draft uh, to, uh, to the team and uh, we, can, we can see if, if uh, we have any interest in uh, having patch in, in the core. That's all. Thank you. Uh, okay, so here's some facts. Women comprise about 50% of our global population as well as their workforce currently, yet their involvement in computer science has dropped over time pretty, you know, pretty heavily. Uh, men and women used to break even on, in uh, degrees and careers in computer science back in the 1970s and 80s, and that number has dropped to about 35% on average today. Uh, from 50%, obviously. And then specifically for our community, data science uh, majors and careers for women, that number is 12%. That is the lowest of all the STEM fields. And I mean, come on, the first programmer in the world was a woman, Ada Lovelace. Like, what happened? You know, what can we do about this? Okay, so once we figured it out, we, we decided we wanted to change it. Why? <laughs> just because uh, we, uh, de uh, we decided that there were no reasons, uh, no reason why women can't be so talented as uh, men. So uh, it's too bad to cut off of all that, that talented people out there. So data science isn't a men's only club, right? So please, if you care about the future of not just our community, but just technology in general, everyone has a hand in fixing this. Men, women, all genders, right? So all of you have the ability to be kind, understanding, and encouraging to young girls and women who are looking to approach the STEM field. If nothing else, you could be a mentor, or you could even offer advice like, how do you get started? Or where do you want to go? Or can, maybe I could give you recommendations, something, you know? And finally, if you're a woman, step into the light and inspire someone. You never know whose life you could change. And so you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and we have a mailing list uh, on postgresql.org. Uh, all uh, people are welcome to our group, and we'll try to make it better for the future. That's all. So, next up, we have Federico, who I guess is a chef. Yep. Oh, perfect. <laughs> yep. Anyone hungry? Uh, yeah. It's going to be worse after this. Yeah, possibly. <laughs> uh, 
Hello. So, uh, I decide to, to check if Postgres can be used for cooking the perfect carbonara dish. I'm Italian. I care a lot about the uh, cooking, and there's a lot of misunderstanding how to cook the perfect carbonara dish. So, Postgres is amazing, and let's see if we can cook a perfect uh, spaghetti carbonara. So, first thing, we need to create the tables, the containers. So, we have the boiling pot, the mixing bowl, the frying pan, Everybody, every, every table have the natural key on the content, uh, and we have the temperature Celsius, sorry. So <laughs> the, uh, the next step is to create the table for our ingredients. So the ingredient name, quantity, the alternative, we have not many alternatives, but there is something, notes, status, and the ordering. But it's very important to exclude the blasphemous ingredients. So we have the check constraint to exclude ham, cream, belly slices, parmesan, wild droggers, anything, pineapple. I also seen spam inside the carbonara. No way. <laughs> so the next step is let's add the ingredients, spaghetti, the notes it says, so if you want al dente, just subtract one minute from the cooking time. And pork cheek we can replace with bacon. Sorry, Roman fellows, it's not, not nice, but I can do it. So grated pecorino cheese, medium side eggs, coarse salt, fine salt, two pinches, ground black pepper, olive oil. On conflict, do nothing. <laughs> then we create <laughs> a uh, storage procedure, a, a function, to boil our carbonara, cook our carbonara. So uh, we raise notice, let's add eggs, pepper, salt, mixing bowl. So we insert into the uh, mixing bowl, and then we mix everything all together with a fork, and raise notice, perfetto. Next step is we add olive oil in the frying pan, uh, turn on the fire and add olive oil, pork chick. There's a bag. I forgot to add the pork chick to the notice. So uh, turn on the fire, wait until the guanciale is cooked and don't make it crispy too. So after 10 seconds, molto bene. And we add the water with a simple select of a generate series. We wait for the water to warm up. When it's up to 100 Celsius, we uh, can add salt and pasta. And finally, we drain the pasta, we delete from boiling pot the water and coarse salt, put everything together, we add the cooked guanciale, then we add the egg turn, mix all together, add grated seeds, mix all together, grated pecorino seeds, so insert into boiling pot, ingredient name, grated pecorino roman cheese, Buon appetito, and return spaghetti carbonara. This is the output. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to download the, uh, uh, the gist, that's the link down there, so you can download the entire source code. Thank you very much. <laughs> Maybe we should have put that at the end, when, when, you know, right before that. Uh, so, now for a more <laughs> serious topic. Yeah, Let's build an application server. Hello. Uh, hi. Uh, I would like you to uh, look at Postgres uh, as an application server. And uh, when we uh, get Postgres as an application server, uh, we have to think about uh, deployment and, uh, and uh, all uh, related and all related uh, issues like debug test, uh, code coverage is a uh, hard thing, I think. And um, we have to do some code deploy system for functions. Of course, uh, trigger uh, trigger consists function, and uh, now uh, I will show some uh, some problem with uh, triggers function. Uh, okay, uh, both continuous. Uh, we have to we have to do uh, deployment without any um, any effects on production. And uh, uh, I'd like to uh, to mention works free. It's I think very important. 
uh, when we <coughs> there is uh, some general pattern uh, for deployment and uh, uh, I have uh, I, uh, I got uh, uh, good experience uh, uh, when this uh, uh, general schema implemented uh, through uh, search path replacement when uh, when if a client of uh, uh, databases functions uh, wants to use new version of uh, a functions API uh, uh, then we uh, switch uh, client to uh, by replacement uh, schema to uh, new version of API. Uh, you uh, you can uh, see uh, this uh, general method by uh, adding. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, when we uh, when we work with uh, function, everything okay. But trigger. Uh, uh, Actually, is not the uh, simple function call. Um, it uh, when uh, when uh, we create trigger, uh, uh, we uh, um, uh, we uh, resolve function name uh, at uh, creation time, and uh, then when trigger uh, then when trigger uh, are fired. Uh, at runtime, we uh, at runtime Postgres uh, that uh, doesn't uh, resolve uh, function name. Uh, so, uh, so we can uh, we can do something like uh, this uh, with uh, red uh, red uh, highlight. Um, uh, we can. Um, and do some uh, wrapper function, and uh, already uh, community uh, maintain some uh, general trigger. Uh, or, uh, or uh, I can imagine something like this. Uh, we can uh, declare a trigger with uh, some option uh, to to do uh, resolve name in runtime, and uh, it was my uh, message. And uh, still some uh, issue uh, present in a list about uh, invalidation in, uh, in in triggers uh, too. Thank you. Any question? Maybe. <laughs> I think he's a little bit scared to talk about corruption. That's what he was still over there, right? I'm not. I'm scared. <laughs> yeah. Where's your clicker? If you want to move. Okay. okay thank Let's you. Corrupt things. So, who has ever seen cor uh, corrupted instance of Postgres? Just raise your hand. So you saw corruption and ah, it's the end of the world. So, Basically, what happens, what are the kind of messages that you would see from PostgreSQL side if you see a corruption? There are many of them. Like, for example, the first one is kind of famous. The could not read block n of relation x, y, z, read, read only 0 out of 8 kilobytes. Like, who has seen the first one? Just wondering. Okay. The second one, catalog is missing from relation. If you are there, like, it's pretty bad already. <laughs> uh, for the third one, using page checksums. Ah, OK. Ah, because I heard a lot of good things about page checksums and actually use so failure, so it's just, it justifies its own existence. So corruption, you can have many, many, many origins related to, po to uh, any kind of corruption. PostgreSQL itself, for example, is one where you could see, for example, the could not uh, read uh, zero out of eight kilobytes, uh, which could be caused by the OID consumption, for example, which has been a recent bug fixed, 
Well, there was also in the past a bug related to the visibility map uh, and uh, reply on standbys. But you could also have things at the file system, the kernel. The more the application stack gets complicated, the more among, uh, the largest amount of risk you potentially see for any kind of things. Of course, you have the CPU memory disks, and you have also other external things, like, for example, cosmic rays. It's proven can go cause fleet bits. Well, if that happens, I don't know. So uh, there is a wiki page on that. If you see any kind of corruption, first read that. It has a lot of references and things. So what should you do when a corruption happens? First, your breath. <laughs> <laughs> and then you stop Postgres immediately. And you are in save as much as you want, save as much as you can mode, really, really at this stage. And one thing that people tend to forget before playing with a broken data folder is that, is that you should take a cold copy of the data folder itself, which you can begin to play with, such as you can save as much data as you can from the instance. When it comes to try to save a corrupted cluster, you can have a lot of imagination. For example, for the missing uh, column for a given instance, well, if you have a fixed schema, you can just update the catalogs uh, manually, and you may perhaps be able to get back uh, some data. PostgreSQL also comes with a couple of uh, options, zero damage, damaged pages, in which case you would actually lose data which is on the pages which got corrupted, and you can also ignore checks and failures, in which case you may actually crash the instance of Postgres itself. So, you have a bunch of options, but be sure that you take a copy of the thing before doing anything, you put that in the same place, and then you try to save as much data as you can. And after that, what can you do to try to detect corruption, to try to find it? You have pgdump. pgdump, the, who thinks pgdump is really a uh, corruption detection tool? Who has already used it to try to detect that? It's not a corruption detection tool. It's in the name. It dumps data. You don't use it to detect corruption. Okay, it's cool. It does some sequential scan, and perhaps you may be able to find some heap pages corrupted on the way, but please don't do that. We have other tools to do that. One of them is PGCAT check, which checks for consistency in the system catalogs themselves. For example, imagine that you are missing an attribute. Emulate that by doing a manual uh, delete on the PG uh, attribute table, and you would see that. You have AM check, which is able to do a bunch of checks. You have page checksums. So, and we have also new tools like PG verify checksums, which is able to check uh, for a stopped cluster that checksums are in a clean state. And we have also other tools like, uh, based on that, there is something called PG checksums that we can use to enable checksums, disable or verify them, and that's all. Do you want to do a very fast lightning talk? No. no okay, no, then don't. No, no. Then we'll pass it on to the next sponsor we're supposed to do, a lightning talk, which is, uh, yeah. Don't take what, are uh, what are we talking about? Oh, it's the partitioning advisor. Yes. That's good. Sorry. You are planning to talk about the thing that's on the slides. Yes. Perfect. Then go ahead. Thank you. So I'm Julian Rowe from uh, France, and I've been working with uh, Yusuko Hosoya for quite some months now to uh, a new feature for HypoPG, uh, which is a partitioning advisor for PostgreSQL. Um, so the, um, the idea of um, the partition advisor is to uh, create like fake partitioning to, like you say, you have a, like a big table and you say, what, how my uh, application would behave if fortunately I would have uh, partitioned my uh, table. And um, the goal of this extension is to be able to do that, try a lot of partitions, different partition schemes and whatever. Um, so, HypoPG, it's uh, an existing extension which already does some kind of uh, advising for indexes. 
uh, it's a little bit the same. It just lies to Postgres and say how my query would behave if this or this index existed in my uh, database. So you can define a lot of hypothetical indexes and see your query plans using uh, explain without analyze and see how uh, Postgres would behave and if it would uh, use the index or not. And there are some uh, other projects which is using this extension. I think like uh, Dexter was uh, uh, published recently. Um, so why doing this, uh, this feature? Um, the, there are some problems. Like the first one is real partitioning on Postgres is quite new. Uh, it was introduced in PG-10 and quite uh, uh, enhanced in PG-11. So I think most people don't really have some enough background on how to partition, on which uh, column to partition, and everything. So uh, the idea is to be able to quickly check with your real, um, real size data uh, for this and try uh, a lot of different uh, partitioning schemes. So I will let uh, Hosoya san uh, continue. So Yes, uh, let's see the example. Yes, at first, uh, imagine this target table, hype table. Uh, three million rows were inserted into this table uh, using generate series. And in this case, as you know, the query plan is like this. And let's create hypothetical partitioning schemes. Uh, you can define the hypothetical partition table using hypopd partition table. Uh, you have to specify the target table as the first argument and the partition by cross the second argument. And uh, also you can define the hypothetical partitions using hypopd add partition function. Uh, you have to specify the partition, hypothetical partition name as the first argument and the partition of clause and the four values clause as the second argument. Uh, these functions require apostrophe to specify this uh, argument. And after that, these hypothetical partitions table and hypothetical partitions are stored into the back end local memory. And so let's see a query plan using explain again. So just like this, you can see the hypothetical partitioning schemes. And uh, also you can find that partition pruning works well. So in addition to this example, you can simulate list and hash partitioning and partition-wise join and partition-wise aggregation and anyway join. So partitioning advisor is already helpful to design partitioning schemes. Uh, our next steps are as follow. We propose to have better integration in Postgres score and we will improve size estimation, a uh, size estimate for hypothetical partitions. And for now, we have been developing for Postgres 7, so we will support Postgres 10 and we will support multi-level hypothetical partitioning and we'll support hypothetical indexes on hypothetical partitions. Uh, we plan to release the first version for Postgres 7. Uh, we hope it will help all of you. Uh, it's a working prototype for now, so we would be happy to have some feedback. That's all. Thank you for listening. And up, and up. Hey, it Hi everyone. Hello. I'm Etienne Bersac from Dalibo. I'm uh, <laughs> I'm writing Python for uh, PostgreSQL. And uh, last year I wrote a tool you may have uh, heard of it. It's called LDAP to PG. It's not a migration tool. It's a synchronization tool. When you play uh, when you use LDAP with uh, PostgreSQL, you just set up uh, in the PGHBA how to check the password uh, in a LDAP directory but you still have to create the roles and privileges and options and memberships. And so this is where the PG helps because it can be very uh, cumbersome to write this manually or to write a, an Adobe script. 
Okay, so there is a few solution already to, to create the rows. So the first option is just to create them manually. You can even save a SQL file in source control. Since you don't save password in it because the password in LDAP, it's, it's quite easy to, say, to save it. But uh, when, it's, again, uh, when you have a, very, a lot of uh, roles to create, it's um, uh, very hard. So you begin to create a script to, that query LDAP to create the roles and then uh, the PostgreSQL can uh, get connected with the role in PostgreSQL, but that's very hard and you can do a lot of mistakes and you don't know how to, what roles you have to remove to drop. So there is a lot of script, uh, such script in, uh, in the industry, but I don't think it's a good solution because there's a lot of bugs in it. And Sybil has a, a few modules to manage roles and uh, privileges that are very nice. However, uh, you, it's very hard to do LDAP queries in Ansible, uh, and so it's very slow when you begin to have a lot of privileges to manage. There's a tool that is uh, unfortunately unmaintained, unmaintained PG LDAP 5, uh, and uh, I borrow some ID from it, but uh, that's uh, the problem with some uh, open source tool, it's not maintained. Uh, one question is, why does LDAP2PG uh, man, uh, manage roles and privileges? It's mainly because of default privileges. You want to create default privileges up when, once you create the role, it's the owner roles itself. If you have one single uh, owner roles, it doesn't matter to manage privilege, privileges. And you're not supposed to manage privileges with LDAP2PG. You just can ignore it and just manage roles. roles. Also, um, it can be easier to manage roles with LDAP2PG because the YAML syntax, the YML syntax is very simple. So this is LDAP2PG. I tried to make it very simple, especially the configuration. If you used to write Ansible playbooks, it's just uh, simple playbooks specialized for, for LDAP and uh, PostgreSQL. It runs almost everywhere with minimal dependencies. We, have, we already have a it installed with, with a very old CentOS systems and so on. The something important is that you don't have to use LDAP. You can just use LDAP2PG to write a, a simple YAML with all your roles and privileges, and it does the synchronization and the checks for you. The, the basic uh, logic of LDAP2PG is, uh, is a loop to that introspect Postgres and LDAP, so it's able to know that someone should not be super user or someone uh, uh, is missing. And the roles are created first so it can manage the owners and then the synchronize the privileges, grants and revokes. Here is a sample YAML. The first uh, directory named privileges allow you to create a group actually of privileges, connect and select our well-known uh, privileges. Each privileges is defined as three queries, one to inspect who have the connect privileges and one to grant and one to, to revoke the privileges. Then you have the sync map, which is a list. It's a bit like task list in Ansible. You just tell create a role named me. You can add options and, uh, and so on. And you have also a grant uh, uh, rules that tells grant privilege uh, RO only to roll me. I think it's pretty obvious. And one thing I, uh, I met with LDAP2PG to be nice with DBA, so there is a lot of messages that are meaningful. Um, they'll help you to debug without knowing how it's done. If you uh, enable verbose uh, debugging, you will uh, see a LDAP search command that you can copy past, and, and that's all. You're out of time. Thank you. I hope you enjoy it. I'm going to hand over to Constantin, mm -hmm. who's on standby. Here we go. Hello, my name is Constantin, uh, and I want to tell you about using standby in production. So, first of all, uh, the structure of uh, today's talk is as following. First of all, uh, did log on standby, then we talk about uh, statement uh, uh, with, ah, statement amount detail, uh, detail and uh, how it uh, replayed on standby. And uh, third, uh, 
work vacuum process and replaying uh, truncating data file on the standby. So first, imagine uh, you have uh, two tables, uh, items and options. Then you open a transaction on your master and alt uh, table options. Then open transaction on standby and uh, select something from items. Then alt uh, items on master and then try to select something from options. So here is a deadlock and it's not detected uh, till 10 version. And in 10 version Postgres is successfully detected. Second, <coughs> uh, the DL statement and uh, uh, the DL and uh, we usually uh, apply the DL uh, for example, altering table uh, with options uh, statement timeout and deadlock timeout. Uh, no, for example, um, 10 milliseconds. And uh, when uh, this is uh, replayed on standby, there is no such options. Uh, so if you have a huge load on your standby, uh, there would be a lot of locks. So it is a problem. To resolve this problem, I uh, suggest next uh, case. <clears throat> First, uh, create a HA proxy script to switch uh, your traffic uh, and uh, stop replication on your active standby. Then uh, apply alter command on master, wait till this command is replayed on inactive standby because uh, uh, we see in uh, wall file and there is uh, several access excessive logs and uh, there is no unlock and in our example we have uh, 75 wall files till unlock comes and it comes with commit. What we can do with this? Uh, first of all uh, we can uh, <coughs> I can suggest for example options that uh, can disable truncating uh, data file for table. Or oh, our colleagues from Postgres Professional uh, <coughs> suggest uh, another, uh, how to say it, uh, way. Uh, the, uh, they say that uh, we should, uh, no, community should try to decrease the number of logs on standby. That's all, thank you. Next up, we have Grant and Atsuru, who will update us on the Asian community. Thank you. Uh, right here and yeah. Clicker. Yeah. Uh, click here. Yeah. Just to left and right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Grant. Uh, I'm from uh, well, from China, and here is uh, Isuru. Isuru Fujita from Japan. Uh, here, uh, we too want to have uh, some introduction to you, to you guys for some events from. Uh, Asia, uh, especially uh, China and uh, uh, Japan, and uh, uh, because uh, well, you know that usually there is a lack of a voice from our our country, and uh, there is a uh, few people have a contribution to our uh, community, and this, uh, well, this uh, is uh, well not good for the uh, PG users, especially uh, we use Postgres, we want to contribute back to the uh, community, but. Still, so we here we come with the uh, China Postgres uh, QL Association, and if people, you guys, if you attend the P uh, Postgres conference uh, U.S. in Kansas City this year, uh, we have set up a table there to promote uh, the China uh, Postgres uh, uh, Association, and it was fun last year and uh, in Beijing and the uh, and the uh, COPU World Open uh, uh, Source Summit. And uh, you can see that we have the uh, official website site here, and uh, oh, sorry, and uh, the purpose is uh, we want to promote the Postgres in China and uh, make some more connections between the international uh, communi uh, community and the China uh, community. And uh, we are doing some uh, support and services to uh, the uh, whole uh, businesses in China, and uh, we we are doing some uh, conferences and meetups. And uh, also, we do some, uh, uh, make some Postgres uh, book translation and publishment so that to help the people uh, to, to promote the Postgres in China. And uh, oh, 
uh, I, I, we, we have uh, the uh, Postgres International Consultant Committee, and now we have uh, uh, Joshua, and we have Bruce, Oleg, Re, Michael, you can see from US, from European, and from uh, different country, so that with the global, uh, with the international uh, community uh, help to make the association more helpful in China. And, uh, and the next month, actually, in China, we have two events. One is the uh, Open Source China, Open Source World Summit, and uh, also uh, together we are we are ho uh, we are holding the Postgres QL Open uh, Summit in China next month. And uh, uh, if uh, and here is our contact and uh, the Twitter. Uh, and I hope uh, in the future we can got more interactive with the global. Uh, uh, Postgres community. Thank you. Um, let me introduce Bijikon.Asia. Um, this is uh, uh, the second Bijikon.Asia. Uh, uh, this is a report on uh, the second Bijikon.Asia. Uh, before the main conference, we had an um, unconference like this PGCon. And uh, uh, around 30 people joined this unconference and uh, discussed many topics such as um, Postgres sharing and uh, yeah, Asian communities. Uh, the main conference started with a uh, keynote by Oleg from Russia. And uh, we had many talks by Bruce, yeah, and uh, Magnus, and many other guys. And uh, in day, in day two, we also had many talks by many people, including Dave and uh, Ishi San. We'd like to thank all the speakers. Uh, this is a ceremony at the uh, closing party. Um, they are going to crack open a uh, wooden cask of Japanese sake to make a toast with this sake. And uh, yeah, splash of sake. Yeah, we all enjoy this sake. <laughs> uh, finally, the announcement of the next PGCon dot Asia. Uh, it will be held on December 10 to 12, Tokyo again. So uh, let's drink sake together. So I think that sets us up perfectly. Let's surprise their organization and all of us go there. <laughs> just to see what happens. And also every one of you should submit a talk yes. to the conference. Yes. So they get a lot of speakers. That'd be a lot of fun. Have we found a file? Yeah, no, I think it's only one of the folders. Could you hit the, the top folder? Special offer for Sandy's customers, that seems wrong. Yeah. Yes, that one. Okay, let's oh, do that one instead. You don't want to do Sandy's commercial. No, I don't. I don't. Okay. I want to do this one. Okay, then do this one. So I hit here. No, oh, that's okay. Your this is what I speak to. Also, awesome. click on this thing and you speak into that. Okay. Not the other way. Okay. Cool. Cool. Thank you. Uh, hey, I was putting together a talk uh, today, and I realized if I change that talk a bit, make it shorter, uh, it would become a good lightning talk. And the name of my lightning talk is: Is PostgreSQL becoming the real-time analytics database? And to start with, okay, what is a real-time analytics database? What is real-time analytics? So this is an emerging workload for databases. Uh, if you haven't heard of it before, maybe you heard of it in a different name, such as an in-memory database or HTAP. And uh, there are different use cases that fall into this workload. Um, I'll think of like a customer-facing dashboard. You log into Google Analytics. Uh, it is when you run a query, it's going over billions of records, and you want the replies in under a second. So that's the typical uh, real-time analytics workload uh, defined in these use cases. And uh, there are a bunch of new databases, proprietary databases, that are specifically built uh, for this workload. What I'll describe in the rest of the Lightning talk is basically there are new features in Postgres, and then the extensible uh, extension framework make it very competitive for this workload. And I'll talk about five of them. 
So the first one uh, by Andres is the just-in-time compilation for faster queries. Andres has been working on this uh, since Postgres 9.6. I think he has a lightning talk tomorrow on the topic. A talk, a yeah, yeah, a talk on the topic. And uh, the way you read this graph is if your workload fits into memory, basically these changes uh, improve performance by 2, 3x for free. So the second one is uh, using approximation algorithms for this workload. Uh, think of the dashboard use case again. So when you're serving uh, real-time requests, you want to, uh, you don't always have to provide exact results. There are extensions such as Hyperloglog or Tophan that enable you to provide uh, approximate results, but in real time. The third one uh, is Citus. It's basically scaling out Postgres. In here, I have a simple architectural diagram. Uh, you basically take your tables, you shard them. Behind the covers, you have these uh, tables, S1, S2, S3, which are each table is a shard. Uh, two things to note in here. Uh, one is uh, basically you typically want to shard on a granular uh, level, such as user ID or device ID. That way you can parallelize your computations across dozens of machines. Uh, the second thing uh, to note is basically why are you doing this? It's ba uh, with this, uh, this way you can keep dozens of terabytes of data in memory, and now you can use hundreds of CPU cores in parallel. The fourth uh, thing, which is new in Postgres 10, is native partitioning. Uh, when you think of the previous diagram or when you think of Google Analytics, one dimension of the data is user ID, device ID, so there is that dimension to it. A second dimension of the data is the time dimension to it. So you can uh, partition your data by time so that your indexes remain local to your partitions and expiring data becomes simple. And the common pattern that we see is you shard by a granular key, such as device ID, or user ID, and then you further partition that data by time. What's exciting is that you can use these new features and then the extensions together. So a common pattern in real-time analytics uh, with some of the proprietary databases is you have some hot data that you frequently update. Say that's today's data, you do updates, updates, and whatnot, and then after a day, uh, you basically close out your partition and rotate it into cold storage. And then with large data sets, there's another uh, Postgres extension, CStore, CStore foreign data wrappers. You can basically sort that data, compress it with CStore, and then put that into a partition. And here's an architectural diagram from a different database vendor uh, that talks more about this idea, where at the top uh, you have your relational regular heap-based uh, structures. You update this, and after a while uh, you close the shard, and then you basically uh, get it into a columnar storage format where you apply compression. To conclude, Postgres is awesome. So proprietary databases built in these features tailored to real-time analytics workloads. Uh, there was a demo that we did at PGCon a few years ago. It was futuristic at the time. Uh, thanks to new features in Postgres 10 and 11, and thanks to the flexible extension architecture, the future is here today. Thank you. There's only one left. You'll get to go soon. Yeah. A lot of pressure. No pressure at all. More food. More food. So sticking with our cool. Cool. So sticking with the food themes from today. Uh, first off, my name is Jonathan Katz, um, and you know I'm not going to get as technical as Federico did in terms of implementing a, a food-driven design. This is going to be more of a philosophical talk about you know something that's very important to well maybe to me. So. For those of you who haven't met me yet, um, I'm from the city of New York, and that becomes very clear quickly when we begin having a conversation. And something that's very important in New York is salad. You know, salad started off as something that was very simple, and it grew and grew to something that was very robust. You could get you know, 50 different ingredients with it, you can mix them up in all different ways, and that kind of led to users expecting a robust salad experience to the point where they could overanalyze it and parse it and really demand what they want. And really what this is, to say is that ordering a salad in New York City is no joke. There is like a lot that you need to consider in terms of requirements. It's not just putting it together, it's delivery, it's execution, it's getting everything there on time. And you know, given you know, how big New York is, you, know, we can, you, know, you can run into various challenges. For instance, are all the ingredients available? If the place I get my salad doesn't have my wasabi kale Caesar dressing, well, I'm out. Traffic also tends to search. 
you know, during, during lunch, during the work week, a lot of people want their salad and they want it quickly because, well, we gotta get back to work. There could also be performance bottlenecks. Maybe someone is you know, really, you know, really harassing the person who's making their salad, you know, demanding, you know, you know, I want this much dressing, this much dressing, or like that tomato example up there. Or sometimes someone can't decide what salad they want, which in my, in my opinion is even worse. Also payments. You know, people are fumbling around for their cash. Their credit card's not going through. I mean, come on, you know, I want to get out of there. I want to pay for my salad. Of course, uptime. Like, we want to make sure that the place is open so we can actually order it. So the user experience isn't just about the flavor or the features of the salad. It's the whole thing. It's the, the whole package, the delivery. And the point of this is, how do they deliver this high-performance salad experience? So I actually researched this. Um, where I work, there's actually a whole cluster of salad places. And I went in, and I wanted to see how could they do this. Actually, this entire talk was going to be pictorial. But I got really self-conscious taking photos of people you know, within, uh, within the salad place. So I decided to make some diagrams instead for it. So first, to handle the indecisiveness and or the overcommunication, there's somebody that's preparing the transactions at the door. You actually see this person right here. And you know, he or she comes up to every person and basically asks what they want. You get a little slip of paper that basically says exactly what your order is, and you, you go to the next step. The next step is gathering the information, or basically, basically gathering the ingredients for your bowl. You hand the slip of paper to someone who basically runs around, gets all the ingredients, and hands you your bowl back. And there's multiple people doing that too, you know, almost asynchronously. And you make sure that you keep everything, uh, keeps all of your ingredients together. You're then assigned to a, you know, to a worker, and there's six background working stations where you can basically parallelize chopping up and mixing your salad. And that's great because you're basically getting in and out very, very quickly, and it's very ordered. Unfortunately, there's still a bottleneck in the process, and it has to do with the payment. Now, you can have multiple cashiers, but there's potentially a lock there because if, you know, the cashier's one, the credit card's not going through, cashier two, you know, the person can't find their money, suddenly the queue is backing up and you can't handle the workload enough. It seems like we're stuck in this high-performance salad problem. But fortunately, thanks to the power of the internet, you can order online. You can asynchronously execute this process by ordering ahead of time, and you're told exactly when your salad is ready. So you can basically optimize the trip from your office to the place to get your salad, and you, know, you get it, and it's all great. But sometimes the system goes down. And then you know, they have to shut everything down, and the restaurant's locked. And you, know, you can't actually get your salad during operating hours. And perhaps you ordered it online, and then you can't get your salad, which actually happened to me. And I'm basically standing outside with the door locked. I see everything inside. I see my salad. I'm like, open the door. Nobody's answering. But <sighs> what can you do? The conclusion is that you know, th this robust salad experience you know, the, basically the salad, the salad industry in New York listened to the market. They basically saw that there was a really high demand for it. And, you know, as, they, as the process, you know, as people kept ordering more and more in salad, they not only improved the process, but they even, you know, they even automated it further and realized, hey, we can get this down from being, you know, a long process to very quick and make sure all New Yorkers are happy with their lunch. Thank you.